Thank you very much to everyone. Am I being able to be heard in the back of the room? Good. Okay. Thank you very, very much for taking time out of the middle of your day. If your schedule is anything like mine, this is a really tough feat to get out of your office, come over here for an hour, and uh, listen to this. So thank you for breaking away from all your other commitments. Uh, I'm going to try to run through some slides. I know this, this meeting is scheduled for 90 minutes to talk with Mr. Cohen. We'd like to try to keep it to more like about 60 and some of the other things that are on your schedule. So I'll, I'll do it. So I've got about 20 or 23 slides. The images that you're going to see come straight out of our master plan, which is really in the final draft form. There's a couple of maps and a couple of words here and there that I want Sasaki, uh, who is our master planner, to, to really tweak before I make this available to the public. But I want you to know that the images that you see today come right out of, of this document. And it's pretty much a, a summary in the 20 or so slides of what's in our, in our current 2018 uh, master plan. A quick word about my background. Um, I've lived in Columbia now for 27 years. First, um, 19, I was actually in private practice as a partner in an architectural firm. And in the last eight, I've had the fortune of being associated with the university as their university architect. As you mentioned, my name is Derek Winner. And uh, it's given me an opportunity to sort of be in the business community as well as, as being a, a part of the university. And for a long while now, I have felt that the university as a flagship university in the city of Columbia benefit enormously from the presence of each other. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that the University of South Carolina is more attractive because of the quality of life that the city of Columbia offers. But also I believe that the quality of life in the city of Columbia is much enhanced by the presence of the University of South Carolina. And I fervently believe that. And it, it really forms the basis of everything that I think about for our city and for our, our university. Um, I, I think it is certainly fair to say that uh, the relationship between the university and their host community, wherever it is now, has it, it certainly evolved since the 60s and 70s. But I think both parties were just kind of doing what each, each wanted. The universities in general, certainly ours, did some pretty insensitive things with respect to, to neighborhoods. But you're going to see in some of these older master plans and uh, underscored in our new master plan that we have now much more profound respect for the adjacent neighborhoods to the university. And I would hazard to say we've got a pretty good relationship at the moment with University Hill. And our Campus Village project that you're going to see in a moment gave us a great opportunity to work with the neighborhoods to the southeast of us, Hollywood and Rivers Hill. A couple of um, other quick facts. Uh, we are one of the top state employers. We have over 7,000 faculty and staff at the university. Our, our budget is in excess of a billion dollars just in Columbia. System-wide, the university's budget is about $1.6 billion. And uh, based on some data, it's probably a couple years old now, but our students, they spend about $200 million of discretionary uh, money annually, of which a good portion of that goes to things like restaurants that fund the, the hospitality tax. And lastly, I'll just say a quick anecdote to emphasize this belief that we're both better for the presence of the other. I, in addition to our, our main jobs on the university, me being the university architect, and there's, there's a lot of folks here at the university, we all have our, our primary jobs, but we're also all ambassadors for the university. And when I walk on the horseshoe, I'll always see uh, parents and, a, and, a, and their child who's here touring the university to see if they want to come here. I don't know if you know this now. It's not like when we all went to college where we maybe picked three or four schools. Students now apply to 20 or 30 universities, and um, they visit most of them, too. So when I see these families on the horseshoe, all they have to do is look down at a piece of paper, and I'm going to assume it's a map, which gives me the entree to go up to them and introduce myself and see if I can help them find wherever it is that they're trying to go. And um, they usually do need a little bit of help, which I love providing. And then I'll get into a conversation of where are they from and maybe what major is their, their child interested in. But the story that I hear quite often is they'll say that they came in from out of state or out of town, they'd never been to Columbia before, and they stayed in a hotel somewhere in the district, Main Street, whatever. And they got out and walked around that night, and they did not realize what a vibrant city Columbia is. And then they'll go on to say, standing in, in the horseshoe, what a beautiful park-like setting this is, and how these two worlds are so different, but they're right next to one another, too. And, uh, it just, just brings me a lot of joy to hear that. It tells me that the university is maintaining 
um, the environment where maybe you should, because you can see the love in their eyes. We, we have a saying that if you can get people to visit the campus and get them on the horseshoe, we kind of got them. Um, the agenda today, I'm going to quickly go through a few slides, just give you some background on the older master plans, just one slide each. But the preponderance of today will be looking at the uh, 2018 master plan. And if there's questions from the community, please, uh, please interrupt me. So, uh, 1994, the Bicentennial Master Plan, we employed Sasaki to come to campus. I don't think we had a master plan in quite a number of years. Uh, this is the old image that came out of that. And um, it provided a certain framework, but I think the most enduring thing that came out of that was it redirected our growth to the west and away from the university built neighborhoods, the neighborhoods here, and said, grow, grow more in the direction of uh, the river. And then in, in 2007, I know you'll recall this InnoVista master plan. This is prior to my time in the university. I came to the university in 2011. But there was this plan by Sasaki to privately develop the land really kind of west of the railroad cut in Gadsden Street on down to a riverfront park. And you can see that the different phases of that that were endorsed by the city. Where we are now, uh, the phase one Green Street from Assembly to Gadsden has been uh, completed, which includes Foundation Square, which you see right here. We've gone from uh, assembly down to about, about Gadsden. The second phase is going to go from Gadsden over to uh, about, well, really all the way to, to UG Street with the bridge over the railroad. Um, that's been in design for some time now, and the construction is slated to begin late 2019, and that's part of the, the penny tax. And then the third phase was to continue William Street uh, along uh, the river, and I don't know the timing on that, but it certainly will be after phase two. So in, in 2010, uh, Sasaki came back to our campus and gave us sort of an update. There had been little, little milestones between 1994 and 2010, but this, this was a rather complete re-look again at the campus. And, and part of what precipitated that was our expectation that between 2010 and 2015, we'd grow by 1,600 undergraduate students. We did, in fact, grow by that amount and actually much, much more quickly in 2015. It also said that we had a lot of campus space that maybe wasn't being fully utilized rather than building new buildings, try to optimize the, the space that we have. And it, it, it um, also renewed the, the sense of integrity that we should have toward our adjoining neighborhoods. And it brought Rocky Branch Creek into the, dis the discussion. That's this greenway that you see here coming through campus. We all know where Rocky Branch Creek is. We all know about the flooding that affects the neighborhoods and the university and Olympia Hill all, all the way down. There was this notion that to be more respectful of this environment, try to alleviate the flooding conditions, maybe even remove some campus buildings that are in the floodplain and make a, a greenway. That has not really been fully realized yet, but it's something that still is very much part of what we want to do there. So I'm bringing you up now to the 2018 uh, master plan. Part of what justified the need to work with Sasaki again and take another look eight years later from 2010 was our current enrollment plan that over 10 years from about 2016 to 2025 suggests that there could be a possibility of growth of about 5,000 students. So what does that mean in terms of the number of classrooms we have and labs and student union space and housing? All those things that, that go with an expansion of enrollment and this growth is not unique to USC, although it's, it's somewhat extraordinary compared to other flagship universities. We have become very, very popular in the last few years, but still you're seeing growth really in all the public flagships around the country. As I said, when we, when we get folks to visit our university and they see the, the environment of Columbia and our, and our campus, um, we're growing. People really do want to be here, and we have some very highly ranked academic programs, of course, our business school, our engineering school that, that brings both in-state and out-of-state students to the campus. I asked them to look back at 2010, see what things that maybe had not been accomplished and what should still be an aspiration for us. And around the fall of 2016, uh, we had begun working with, with Krista Hampton, John Fellows, and a lot of city staff with this idea that we would do some improvements to South Main Street from Pendleton down to Blossom. So we were really in the thick of working with the city in a collaborative way at a lot of, a lot of different fronts. And so the, the 2018 master plan um, 
really reflected in what was going on at that moment with Sasaki helping us with Main Street and with the city. So the master plan continues to look for opportunities to work uh, with the city and then just provide uh, some guidance for other campus developments um, that, that we had going on, such as campus village and Coliseum. I also asked the 2018 master plan just for, for historical perspective to give a quick nod to what we had accomplished since 2010. I won't dwell on this, but you can see from these numbers, the university accomplished quite a bit. Uh, there was certainly some new structures, maybe <coughs> the Darlemore School of Business, and the law school, and some athletic facilities, 650 Lincoln um, housing. But um, this renovated building number also uh, is meaningful to me. You know, yeah. Before I came to the university, I was a design architect. I designed a great many buildings in Columbia. I had the fortune to do that. When you come to the university, what you find yourself in as an architect is a little bit of a, of a different role. You're now a steward. You are helping some new development, but you're trying to uh, restore and refurbish what you have because we have over 200 buildings on our campus and, and um, over 12 million square feet. So in that eight years, uh, at least a dozen or so buildings were taken and comprehensively renovated, meaning all the mechanical systems, roofs, windows, and, 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 and took a building that maybe hadn't had that level of work in 30 or more years, and essentially you made it a new building. And this includes many buildings on the Horseshoe that you would know, some of the residence halls. Uh, Hamilton, for instance, you may have noticed that all the window unit air conditioners went out of Hamilton in 2014, and I could go on and on with, with these projects, and uh, frankly, it just kind of warms my heart to uh, to bring these buildings back to life and make them, make them healthy again for the students and the faculty. Also, we, we did our first public-private partnership at 650 Lincoln, which is something new for the university. So among the more memorable things about the 2018 plan, we wanted to continue generally infill densification, meaning that we're not trying to expand and, and build new buildings on land outside our periphery. We have to be sensitive to how long it takes a student to walk from one side of the campus to the other with a 20-minute class change. So we would look for opportunities where we maybe have parking lots in our campus or areas that are just not sufficiently dense to, to expand square footage. Um, we did look at the classroom and lab space in light of the enrollment row. And obviously, uh, as you grow your student volume, you have to get them from one place to another in 20 minutes. You start to think about those connections, the streetways and sidewalks, and how do you make it convenient and safe. That's another rather profound realization I had as I came to the university was the importance of the quality of a street and the landscaping on just the quality of life. It's really more important than the individual buildings. Uh, the campus is more important than any one building or even the sum of the buildings. The campus is what matters. And the streets are, are, are so essential uh, for creating the character of that campus. You're going to see um, a rather expansive and, and very aspirational plan for the engineering district down near Swearingen. And we have a desperate need uh, for, for student life space. So there's about 10 or so planning priorities that are in this 2018 master plan. And I'm going to go through about seven or eight of them that I think are relative to the, the planning commission. Um, first of all, this is the uh, most recent campus plan that tries to project growth all the way out to about 2050. Again, you can see this current theme of respecting the sanctity of the neighborhoods, the infill that I mentioned, and also the analysis of the number of classrooms we would need for that enrollment growth was done empirically. And the, the availability of classroom space and close hip, and as we build out the old law school, we think is going to provide us enough space for labs and classrooms. So I, I just say that the importance of that statement is that we don't see ourselves building another academic building, at least until after 2025, based on what we, we think right now. Um, I mentioned the, the connections. Sasaki took a look at this and tried to determine where, where are people moving mostly on campus. And I'll explain the importance of these four key connectors. Obviously, Green Street has been so pivotal to the Invista master plan since 27, uh, 2007. It's really the main east-west connector on campus connecting the Horseshoe and uh, Gibbs Green and even East Campus eventually one day all the way to the river. Marion Street is important in that it connects the Horseshoe 
down to the athletics village with the campus village right here along this path. So thousands and thousands of students traverse that walkway every day. Main Street finds itself now really in the middle of our campus geographically. Whereas we started over here with the horseshoe, you can see that Main Street is, is in the core. We think that Main Street can be improved. You're going to see some images for that. And then Catawba Street seeks to one day join the engineering quadrangle here with this incubator tech corridor that I think has is, is been actually uh, is described that way, I guess, in your, your zoning ordinance. So uh, the engineering district, just to give you uh, some points of reference, this is Swearingen, the 1980s large building there that's bounded by assembly uh, to the west and Main Street here uh, to the east. This, um, we think about as really a kind of a forgotten area of campus. Uh, in fact, there are streets down there that don't even have sidewalks. Uh, when our students uh, pass underneath the, the railroad bridge, um, they have to actually walk out into the road. It's just an area that doesn't match the level of, of development and refinement the rest of the campus has. So when Saki came back in 2018, we wanted to focus them on this area. And you'll, you'll recall that some of this comes obviously from the 2010 plan where Rocky Branch Creek would be a greenway. But anticipating that the College of Engineering will grow, as most of our STEM majors are right now, they looked at ways to uh, add square footage with some new buildings on land that we currently own, and also actually remove a building we call 300 Main, which is right here right now on Main Street. It's an old SCE&G facility. Um, has rather enormous maintenance needs, but also is in, in the floodplain of Rocky Branch Creek, <coughs> which the creek, as you see, comes right here. This is where we've had so much flooding in the past, we don't even allow students to park on the empty lot next to the building. So what this plan would hope to achieve one day is 300 main is removed from this floodplain and its square footage is just replaced in other buildings and um, we have a greenway that can be followed all the way down to the river. The sidewalks be improved in this area and become something that looks more like what we all associate with this part of the university. You see that image up there with swearing it there in the distance to the left with the water feature here to help alleviate flooding. And by the way, I should say, there is really no timetable for those buildings that you see here. The university right now at least has other, other priorities. Uh, and this being one of them. Uh, Campus Village, uh, we started conceiving this project probably all the way back in 2015, started talking to the neighbors. And uh, this one really evolved over the next two or three years. And I have to say that the involvement from the neighbors really made this a better project too. It became more than just buildings. It got into conversations about safety guides and how students are walking to five points and, and traffic counts and parking. Uh, I, I hope that when this is one day realized that this becomes like a model for a university neighborhood you know, interaction. But what this will do is take the area that right now is populated by Bates House, kind of roughly in this area, Bates West and Cliff Apartments, and an enormous like six acre surface parking lot that's right here. All those buildings are really at the end of their useful life. This plan would demolish those three buildings and come back and increase the bed count from around 1,400 as they are now up to 3,750 and about eight buildings that are all shorter than the buildings that are there now. The buildings that are there now vary from about um, eight floors to about um, 14 or 15 floors. And so the, the trick for us was we want more beds because we have desperate need to house more students on campus, uh, particularly the freshmen, we mandate they live on campus. And we have a lot of sophomores that want to live on campus, but we just don't have enough residents on campus beds to satisfy them. We wanted to increase the amount of green space and in landscape, it, like what you'd see at Gibbs Green or, or Horseshoe, and create an architecture that is uh, a little bit more transitional not ultra-traditional, but also not contemporary and modern, but something that would blend with the adjacent neighborhoods and be something that I think people would love for many decades going forward. We, we conceive these to be 60 to 80 year buildings with steel structures and concrete floors and uh, cast stone and masonry skins. This is not wood frame construction here. So this is the, the most current design. Uh, as for where this project stands, 
the delivery method of whether it'll be a public-private partnership or whether the university will, will sort of self-develop this in a traditional way is still what's being determined. And we do that in conjunction with the state legislature and the Joint Bond Review Committee. And I think we're probably just a few months away from determining what that delivery method would be. And we hope to have uh, the first phase of this done around 2022. The first phase really is this piece right here. When this is complete, then the students will move out of Bates House and Bates West and move into these buildings. And the Bates buildings will be torn down and replaced with the second phase. And then the third phase over here, this lower rise, really only just four stories, whereas most of these are about six. Uh, we, we decided to step down the density as you get closer to the neighborhood here. We actually have also um, designed this in such a way that, that we can demonstrate there will be less cars on Whaley Street as a result of this. We're not adding parking spaces. We worked with the city to actually reduce the number of parking spaces required by bids because we're finding that less students now are bringing cars to campus. It's a great trend. It's something we very, very much want to support. We don't like having to take care of, of the cars and take up valuable space. Parking decks are also expensive to build. There is one parking structure right here that has the same number of spaces that was currently in the <coughs> district, and students that have the permit to park here will not have a permit to park anywhere else on campus. So there's no motive for getting in your car and driving to class. They will walk to class. And that's really one of the keynote strategies for keeping the amount of vehicular traffic on Whaley Street down to current levels or even less. We're also going to upgrade the safety of this, this railroad crossing there. Yeah. So that's Campus Village. Another project that I'm sure many of you have heard about is this health science campus that we want to construct over a great number of years out of the Bull Street property. At the intersection of, this is Harden Street here, you see Colonial Drive, there's some land that's been set aside to do this health science campus. Part of what's driving this is currently the School of Medicine with the university resides out at the VA dorm facility. We have a lease with the federal government that expires in 2030. And the, 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 the government has made it clear that they need space back. They want to take this space back to serve the veterans. So we, we're looking at sort of a 2030 clock that is counting down to where we're going to have to vacate our School of Medicine and move it somewhere else. And we've determined that this is an ideal location because of its proximity to the Palmetto Health Campus. And the university also has some clinical buildings over here. So we see the opportunity to create this health science campus that would have a, a medical teaching building first. That's our highest priority and then a research building second with sufficient acreage to have other buildings that would come out in the future. For instance, maybe one day other, other programs that are synergistic with health sciences could come here and free up space in existing buildings on the Columbia campus, which, which then means we don't have to try to construct new buildings on the, the main campus, which is about two miles from here. You may wonder, well, why are you worried about something in 2030? Uh, things move very slow and cautiously at the university, along with funding challenges and, and state approvals. We have to start thinking 12 years in advance. Our law school, we spent more than 12 years developing the law school. So uh, this, that was really actually in our front windshield right now. Uh, I also mentioned this desire to connect the campus to the Congaree River. This is something as an architect I'm enormously excited about and, and, and we hope to see in my time. Um, the two main connection opportunities are Green Street, which we've already talked about, which goes back to that 2007 plan. And um, that one I, I feel pretty good about. Block by block, we have been improving uh, Green Street uh, with the support of the University Hill neighborhood, which I remain very grateful to have had. We were able to close the segment of Green Street right in front of the Russell House. And now our students, when they come out of the Russell House, they can just walk across the street. We can have functions in, in the street because we gated those ends. And then phase one of the Inta Vista plan, Foundation Square is complete. Phase two is, is getting ready to begin. So um, the bike lanes, the wider sidewalks, the trees are going to make that a, a wonderful street. Rocky Branch is still this, this challenge out there to be realized, but when we do, it's going to be just a tremendous opportunity for students and the neighbors to ride bikes all the way to the river and then connect with sidewalks and walkways we already have up and down the river um, and also connect with the development I'm going to show you a little bit to the south here in, in just a moment. 
Um, also, I mentioned uh, student union space. As I said before, when enrollment grows, the services that a university provides is amazingly broad. Uh, those services have to grow with it. Uh, sometime long about maybe the 50s, uh, universities stopped being just a place with a lot of classrooms and people went to get an education. They became like a city within the city, in our case. All of a sudden, we had to provide more student health disability services, uh, dining opportunities, uh, recreation opportunities. And, um, and we're not unique in this. All the flagship universities are doing this because the expectations that the students have now is, is just, I would, I'm would i certain it's unlike what any of us had when we were in college in the 80s and 90s and earlier. Um, we have not really expanded the Russell House since, I guess, the mid-70s. I can only imagine what our enrollment growth has, has done since then. I think it's probably fair to say it's at least tripled. And so we've been studying for some time now strategies to expand the amount of space in our student union, which what, what I mean by that is the student union comprises things like meeting space for the students, uh, particularly after hours, groups, parties, sororities need meeting space, dining platforms that, that serve uh, food that is as good as most restaurants in Columbia, if that's what the expectation is. Um, entertainments, game game rooms, all, all of those items, along with some retail in the bookstore. We haven't expanded ours since the 70s. In fact, we now are really the last school in the SEC not to have a student union expansion. So we're, we're focused on that. Some of the options that we're looking at is an adaptive reuse of Carolina Coliseum. We have gone as far as just to with conjecture what might a renovated Coliseum look like. Um, so. These are not plans that are approved. This will change, but it, all these serve to try and do is to inform people that the old Carolina Coliseum can look completely different than what it looks like right now. It can be, could be completely reprogrammed. There is no funding in place for this. So I showed this today with this, this caution. This is really just sort of an artist's conception of what could happen there. We're also going to look at an expansion to the Russell House to see if that's a more economical alternative than than the adaptive reuse of the Coliseum. But also the South Main Street that I'm going to come to in a, a couple more slides. We see that with the improvements that is going to happen starting late 2019, we hope that private sector development is going to come into South Main Street and create some restaurants, maybe some appropriate housing, other things that will create a draw for our <coughs> students in addition to five points. Again, this is now right in the heart of our campus, as this suggests. And this is just a short distance from so many uh, underclassmen, freshmen, undergrad uh, residence halls that Main Street has a chance to be something uh, just tremendous in support of our student life needs. Uh, another student life need that we have is uh, outdoor recreation fields. We lag well behind all the standards of measurement that suggest that if you have an undergrad enrollment of X, you should have this number of multi-purpose fields, this number of soccer fields, baseball fields, tennis courts, all those things. There's actually rules for that. And um, we're woefully behind in that. But you can kind of imagine the challenge that the University of South Carolina has because we're an urban campus. Our, our campus is still very much dictated by the original grid that was laid out by Ginyard in the 1780s. And with land costs downtown, you have to go out and buy enough land to to make a multi-purpose field is prohibitively expensive, and nor should that really even be how urban land is really even used in our state. I, I like um, mid-rise, lots of density, because um, you create a cohesive fabric that way. When you have surface parking lots and, and big gaps in that fabric, I actually feel like it's detrimental to the character of the city or a campus. But this, this um, opportunity here that presents itself, it was 300 acres down by the river that was purchased by our University Development Foundation a few years ago with the thought that, first of all, it's really all of the floodplain, or virtually all of the floodplain. So it's not a good candidate for any kind of vertical development, but it's ideal for um, intramural recreation fields for the students. So we're going to start pretty soon determining how might this be laid out. But to give you an orientation, uh, this is Bluff Road. This is National Guard Road. You can see Williams Bryce just kind of creeping in the upper right corner there and Gamecock Park. 
we'll be able to run shuttles back and forth from campus to get students back and forth from these rec fields. But we know from, from real data, we're using our rec fields two and three times the amount of intensity that we, that we should just because we don't have enough. And as I mentioned before about Rocky Branch Creek, if we can get Rocky Branch Creek with a greenway one day to the river, well, it's not too far fetched to imagine that a greenway along the river this side could link down to here. You could, you could easily ride a bike from your dorm along Rocky Branch Creek, get to the river, and bike down to that side. What excites me about this is I just think that this will be one of the more memorable things about the university one day. If people are, oh yeah, USC, that, they're the people that have acres and acres of rec fields right on the Okay, South Main Street. Uh, I mentioned back in the fall of 2016, uh, a group at the university had this idea that South Main Street really needs to take on some of the improvements that we've seen on North Main Street. The car counts are really low on that street because, of course, it terminates at the State House at the north end, and it kind of peters out down around I guess, Whaley Street to the south, so you don't get through traffic on that street. It has two lanes north, two lanes south, turning lanes, and uh, there's just very, very low traffic volumes. So as we were thinking about streets and uh, connectivity, what we started to, to imagine was maybe we could reduce the lanes. Keep on street parking in most cases, but then develop bike lanes and wider sidewalks so there could be cafe seating and restaurants. So we had this, we had this idea, and it, and it came about with some input from Sasaki. So we started having public meetings with the, the various private sector landowners in these eight blocks, a number of, I guess, three or four, I guess, public sessions as we were talking about the development of the plan. And uh, with, with a lot of collaborative help from the city planning staff, Kristen, John, and most notably, we, we came together with this vision of what this corridor could be. And indeed, the Department of Transportation is now engaged with this, and they're working on the design that the city and the university created together. So what you have existing up top, you see the power lines and, and all of this, this asphalt. And I didn't just take that picture when there was no cars. You can kind of just walk out there at any time and say, take a photograph. It looks pretty much like that. Again, absolutely just an artist's conception of what it could be with a narrower roadway and, and the bikes. And then some private sector development in this kind of mid-range four to six stories, which is what the design overlay for this, this area now uh, would request to do. But you can see that still we can get an enormous amount of gross square footage in this corridor. And again, please look at this purely just as an artist's conception. It's just this notion that if you have some parking structures, put them more to the middle of the block, wrap active uses, retail and housing and commercial are kind of around it. You know, university doesn't control all this land. Uh, a lot of this is state, some of it is, is private. But it's just, it's just trying to foster a vision for what this, what this corridor uh, can become. And also, we very much wanted to keep a good sight line to the, uh, the dome of the Capitol. So I can even imagine when this is done, there could be times when the street could be closed and there could be uh, much like what happens on the north side when you close the streets and have markets and Plot, plot, have street service plot for the students. Uh, this brings me to near the end of my talk. I wanted to just get a nod to uh, the rewrite of the zoning ordinance, which offers this um, opportunity to university and large hospitals to form their own zoning district within their realm. And it's been called the Institutional University and Medical uh, District. And if a university or a hospital wants to participate in this, what they have, what they're obligated to do is working with city staff, develop an institutional development plan. So what that plan will do is sort of define the realm that we see as the university realm, fully acknowledging though that within that realm there are lots of private, privately owned properties, there are churches, there are there's retail, there's commercial, there's, there's private housing. But what would be the character of, of that district? that preserves the things I started out talking about today, is the importance of good architecture, good streets and landscaping, and quality design. That's what gives the university character. And we're, we're rather passionate about protecting it because it's part of our brand. It's what we think makes us successful. 
Um, you see there are some of the things I just, I just mentioned. What we would be trying to do with this IDP is, is to preserve that sense of, of building heights and scale and mass that people identify as what the university is, is really all about. So this, what I'm showing you here is something that we would be working on in the future going forward. But um, we're really pleased with the way that the zoning rewrite is going. Frankly, you all know it was, it was high time to do this. And just the whole format and graphics of this new rewrite are so much more user friendly. Uh, we look forward to working with the city and going through um, this process. And ultimately, that IDP, as you see here, would be approved by uh, your commission and uh, city council. And I guess that would be later in 2019 or 2020. I'm not sure how long the study would take. It would take some time, of course. So I've tried to go um, fairly swiftly. That's the last slide I have. I'd love to entertain any questions that you might have. I think I've lost over something. Any thoughts on the uh, old Carolina Coliseum, what you might be thinking about, and after attending an event at the new Colonial Life Center, any plans for better parking and access in and out? Of, uh, of Colonial Life? Yes. Again? Okay. The, uh, the Carolina Coliseum, built in 1969, uh, still has one floor in that building that's academic. We, we still have a program in there. We're going to continue to use that floor for academics for the foreseeable future until we raise enough money to do the adaptive renovation that you saw on the slide. But what we've looked at for the Coliseum with the most detail right now is more student union space that would include uh, a, a, a ballroom taking advantage of some of the height that we have. But it would take the stands out of it with just about your gut. But lots of um, student meeting space, dining, some retail. We'd love to find some public-private opportunities there as well, companies that might come in lease some space from the university so we can generate some revenue. Those artist conceptions I showed you are enormously expensive, north of $100 million. We have a lot of priority right now. Uh, but ideally, that's what we'd like to do with the Carolina Coliseum, is find a completely new use, focused focus mostly on the students. Colonial Life Arena, as for parking, which you asked about, uh, Part of the phase two Green Street project requires that the facilities organization relocate. Now, I don't know how many of you know where facilities is, but if you're, if you're driving down Green Street heading west, heading toward the river, you have Colonial Life on your right, you might remember there's a one-story kind of nondescript building there just, just past the Colonial Life Arena. That's actually where the facilities offices are that maintain the university, and that's hundreds of employees, hundreds of service vehicles, pickup trucks, trash trucks, every imaginable type of vehicle, is all right there. Uh, it finds itself now in the middle of a kind of burgeoning in a Vista district. And because of the phase two Green Street and the bridge over the railroad, it's really time for facilities to move. So we're also in the process of relocating facilities from the Vista. What that's going to do then is free up that land. And with the help of Derek Huggins, our vice president of facilities and transportation, we're looking at options of providing more commuter, student commuter parking there next to Columbia Light. They could also double for some event parking. Um, so that's how we, we, we want to try to add parking. We, we, we have thoughts about a garage in that area, but I, I will tell you that the, as we see diminishing numbers of students bringing cars, we're trying to be very, very careful we don't build parking structures that will overpark the university in, in the future. And that's a trend we're seeing universities too. We have this uh, shuttle program that picks up people at other places on campus now and takes them to sporting events at Colonial Life Arena and the football. And that has helped with the, the parking stress that's near Colonial Life. So uh, we recognize that uh, when 650 Lincoln was developed, it took some parking in that, that district and we were able to move that, that parking around. And I know when there are popular events at Colonial Life Arena, we, we try to spread it. You talked a little bit about, the, or talked a lot about the west side and the south side. What about up along Gervais Street on that northern end of the campus? Do you have any additional plans up that way? We've seen some things come through the Planning Commission that along that Gervais Street corridor that the university was not necessarily, you know, right. planning of. 
about. So just wanted to see if you could talk to some of your plans on that north end. Okay. Yeah, we had a concern about a proposed development that we thought was going to do a very tall building in, in, in an area. This, this, when I think about the university realm, I'm thinking kind of south of Gervais. And uh, so that, that was a concern as it was for the neighborhood. But as far as the university developing anything along that corridor, there's really nothing in our plans. We, we, our foundation took possession of the Whaley House, which was sort of gifted to the university. And we're looking at various uh, users for that house, but that's a historic house. We're not going to remove that house or replace that house with your thing. Uh, we have there's to renovate it and put, put a roof in that house. Uh, I don't think the university even controls any of the land in Walker today. So uh, our, our growth is really going to be to the west and the south. Speaking of the University uh, Development Foundation, can you tell me how the buildings and property that they currently own fit into this plan, or are they an entirely separate kind of Yeah, plan I guess I'd say it probably runs to both ends of that spectrum. Um, there are certain pieces of property that the Development Foundation you now technically owns, they have, they have the title to it, that Will, it, when the timing is right, when the university has funding, the university will, will acquire it from the Dale Foundation, like those 300 acres that I showed you by the river. Uh, there are uh, other financial and property holdings that they have that are not to be acquired by the university. I couldn't stand here today and represent, I don't even know all of them. But our foundation functions like a lot of development foundations do for universities. They, they have they, they can be a little bit more nimble with um, property acquisitions. That for the university to acquire property is a long, drawn-out state process that sometimes um, takes longer than what a certain seller might want to wait. If the seller wants to sell a piece of property in the university, I have to tell them it'll take at least a year before we can get approval. So the development foundation can sometimes step in there. But I think they have their own mission, which is to, to be financially um, self-supporting. So they have to make business decisions also about acquisitions too. The, the foundation was involved in the 650 Lincoln uh, project, and so they have an interest in that. And 650 Lincoln didn't mention this, but it's just performing wonderfully. 100% occupancy, the students want to live there. It's one of our desirable places to live. But that's an example of a university development. Yeah, I guess um, you know part of what I think about in terms of the Development Foundation is the situation with the Women's Club on Blossom Street, and yeah. that that was um, didn't seem to be handled very well, and also uh, was not good communication between the neighborhood and the university. Right. Um, so when you talk about this larger plan and the idea that the Development Foundation has really, it, it almost seems like no responsibility to this plan and no uh, commitment to ensuring that they develop the properties that they own congruent to this plan. Yeah. So that seems problematic. Yeah, there's some overlap with, with the acreage for the rec fields, but the Women's Club was not handled well by the foundation. Frankly, my office wasn't even aware of what was going on with the Women's Club, I hate to say. It's one of those, that's one of those cases where I don't know that there was much of any collaboration between the foundation and the development. They, the development foundation, um, they had been trying to sell that land for some number of years. I thought they had a deal with a group that was going to preserve the building that were really just a couple of days before demolition that someone else was buying it. And I, I don't really know what the plans are. I drive by it every day. I've driven by the Women's Club every day for the 27 years. But I guess my concern is I, I hear that you're saying that you know that was a problem, and I think that's uh, agreed to be a problem. Yeah. My concern is um, the University Development Foundation is still a part of the university, and that there appears to be no accountability to the plan that you're describing. And so um, I'll just say it again that that's concerning um, because I there's. 
it almost seems like no input, no, you know, I come back to accountability, or they, you know, you say they're nimble, that's great, but they also seem to have their own rules. Yeah. Um, they, which, are their own, they are their own organization, uh, community follow that they, yeah. that they got. And I hope they grow. Derek, are there any, what, what do you foresee as the development on South Main? And also, my last question is, I hope you develop and take advantage of the river that hasn't been done in this city. Well, I can agree with more about the river. I'd love to see uh, development on the riverfront. Well, we would too. That, that's where Rocky Branch and Green Street, I talked about reaching the river for our students. River, everybody knows, is a great untapped opportunity and resource with the city of Columbia. Um, so I share that. Yeah, but university priorities have to also get to remember be focused on what are the students paying for through their, their tuition. So, you know, our mission is really on campus, but we wholeheartedly support the riverfront park. Um, but as for development on South Main, uh, the, the private land can be developed, and I think whatever the highest best use are by those private landowners. I just know that when you look at South Main, you have a few historic buildings that are much restored buildings right, right near downtown. Our plan uh, that we developed acknowledges the importance of, of those buildings to the fabric, but, but also you have parking lots, surface lots, there are these, these tears in the cohesiveness of that street that we just don't think is the, the highest and best use of it. Land. So, part of part of our belief is if, if we can improve the street and create what I showed you in those renderings, that it becomes something desirable for a private development. Now, the university does own some of the blocks along that street, and one day near the law school, we may do a building, an academic building that will contribute to the street. But as you get up to those blocks closer to Pendleton or College, a lot of that is, is private, and some of that is state. And we are talking also to the state. Trying to get them to think about what the highest and best use is for their land. I guess it's just the old, a old that the law comes school first. Are you, are you referring to the old law school? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the old law school is, is right here. And uh, this right now is the parking lot. We've had a thought for a long time that we would help to green that. And the, um, the law school doesn't make a very good edge to Main Street. Right now there's an auditorium there that's a little uh, clunky geometrically. So maybe one day we develop an academic building here that contributes to the facades that are on the street. Right now that law's not, not doing that. But um, you know, you know there, there's, there's private holdings in here developed as the market sees fit. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I guess if there are no other questions, we'll adjourn. Motion, Motion to adjourn. Thanks, everyone.